My name is Rick Winicky. I came to Israel about 30 years ago. I was looking for God. I knew that somehow he had something to do with the Jewish people. The plan was to come work on a kibbutz. I, I discovered the, really the meaning of the Holocaust within relationship on the kibbutz. What I also found in route to Israel and within this land was the person of Jesus. My wife and I, Daphna, are now living in a little town in the northern Negev. And we've been creating, working through a piece of work right now called the Fountain of Tears. It, it's, it's almost like conversation between two distinct personalities, both speaking out of their place of suffering, one being the crucifixion and the other being the Holocaust. The panels within the element of the, of the Fountain of Tears is basically divided into seven panels. Each one of the panels represent one of the last seven words that Jesus spoke from the crucifixion. What you have as dividers between each one of the panels are six pillars of stone. The six pillars of stone, just from the number, it represents a memorial to the six million. The whole word, when we were struggling with this, the word that we ended up getting from the Lord was, Jer or was Jeremiah 9, where Jeremiah is crying out to the Lord and he's saying, Oh Lord, that my head would be a spring of water and my eyes a fountain of tears, that I would weep day and night for the loss of my people. Like I think of that word, it always gets me because I think the prophet's asking for a spring of water, a continual source that he can continually weep day and night. Like it just, it's amazing. It's something outside of himself, the tears. What Daphne and I have expressed, what we have found out in, in really struggling with this, that a lot of times the tears come from a place outside of yourself. And I have done massive amount of weeping over this thing. It, we never expected it to be public. You guys should have never even been here, really, in my thinking. I wanted this to a certain degree. I didn't want anything to do with this. I didn't want to put the two parts together. I didn't want to examine the Holocaust. So just the fact that you're here is pretty amazing. And I started to look, because I didn't have anything intentional with this at all. People think, wow, where did you come up with this idea? Forget it. It's like you struggle with every single idea. As you step into it, it unfolds a little more and a little more. It's been seven years in processing through up until this point. And I'm still feeling like there's stuff I haven't, I haven't seen in this. My whole struggle within this was how do you create a memorial to six million when you don't have a memory of it yourself? 
how what there is no memory resource within you as the artist that you can pull from in order to create and at that point i felt like the lord said to me but i do it's not that i have just a memory as one individual going through say the camps and the death's marches and all the all the elements of the nightmare that an individual himself could carry. He has a memory of everyone, every child, every old person, every form of killing that was created. He has a memory of it all. So I'm looking at all of these things within the creative processing, pulling from points of relationship, points of information that I've read historically, but again, in a sense of the emotional attachment of feeling the heart of the Father so on this thing that it's somehow he's motivating this and in, in, in a sense, trying to create a place of healing for this wound, somehow paying back what has been taken from them, ravaged from them in such a violence. And I, I looked at it and I thought to myself, there's even an identification where the Holocaust represents almost like the crucifixion of the Jewish people. There's an identification to the death to the violence of the death, to the place of burial, where Jesus is buried for three days. The Jewish people, in a way, are buried for three years. The dialogue between these two personalities begins in Gethsemane. The piece in the corner represents the figure of Jesus almost poured out over a large stone. When the son decides within the struggle to do the will of the father and not his own personal will, it becomes then the starting point to the crucifixion. You know, you're allowed a little bit to identify me personally to this of taking this cup because I thought if I do something like this, all my Israeli friends that I've known over the years, the guys in the army, the people on the kibbutz, people that I've known now spread out over when I began this over 20 years, felt like this is really going to cost. They're going to start to, you know, this, this is going to be so... Um, so controversial in a sense towards them that they're able to accept you to a certain degree but these two personalities together it'll be too much and they'll start to distance themselves from you so I met Rick at his house uh, he brought me to his studio in his backyard. And this is when the artwork was just in the midst of in its completion process. He didn't have the roof over the studio just yet. I was busy in the studio. So David was left alone for about 10 minutes before I could get to him, right? When I came in, the little bit that I had known him but felt like I was getting to know him, I could tell that he was irritated. How dare he go ahead and take a sacred historical event especially that it was the Christian theology, the underpinnings of the Holocaust that led to this horrific event, even though my own family was not affected personally by it, but I mean, just learning about it and my own friends and, and other people I've met throughout the years, you know, we understand that Christianity was part and parcel for this event to happen. How dare he even approach the subject with the crucifixion of Jesus? Linda Olmert is like a really good friend of ours. We've, you know, we met through a lot of funny circumstances, but we've, we've gone through a number of things together. 
So I go to see the sculpture where Jesus is on, in a, on a cross, carved out of Jerusalem stone, uh, stones that he possibly touched as a Jew walking Jerusalem and walking the Galilee, in dialogue with a Holocaust survivor. She gets like, I mean, hyper animated, and she's going, I can't, oh my God, what have you done here? She's like, I can't, I can't believe this. And I was blown away. I, I was absolutely blown away. To me, it was just, it, it, it was just incomprehensible a person would do that. But from an artist's point of view, it's exactly what he was supposed to do. He was supposed to bring me to that boundary and give me that shock value to sort of go ahead and flesh out what he's trying to do as an artist, as a Christian artist. And is it offensive? Is he trying to be offensive? Is he trying to take a topic that's so controversial that we don't want to deal with and deal with it straight in your face? I mean, there's no other way to deal with this than you have to talk about how Jesus was in effect with the Holocaust. The, the beginning of crucifixion is Gethsemane, and then you move to the first word. The first panel is, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they do. The expression within the panel itself is a point of declaration. It's a point of, of the figure with his hands wide open, making proclamation. There's a, there's a sense within the face of it being intentional. The figure representing the Holocaust is clutching his chest. It's almost like the sense within the covenant is forgiveness I received to myself. So he's clutching his chest, but his other hand is turned and he's leaning into his hand, pressing it against the stones with his forehead. And in a way, what's what I'm trying to communicate is the sense of, all these relationships that I've known with survivors, the stories that I've read, the whole aspect really within in the heart and the mind of most survivors is, is if I touch the word forgiveness, it somehow will mean that those that perished will be forgotten and I can't forget them. It'd be almost like they would be twice betrayed. The second word out of the seven is, Today you'll be with me in paradise. From the point of view of the crucifixion, there were two other thieves that were crucified with Jesus. In a sense, what you get is the one thief, say to the left of Jesus, is, is cursing him. The thief to the right is asking to be remembered. From the survivors that I've known when I've related this story to them, they have said to me, Within the camps, we represent both these thieves. We curse God and we cried out to him all at the same time. It was a constant, somehow remember us. The third panel is, mother, this is your son. Son, this is your mother. For me, it was, again, a creative struggle within the communication. From the point of view of the crucifixion, he's speaking this to Mary and to John, the only disciple that stayed during the crucifixion. Historically, in a way, what he's saying, his hands are together, his head is pointed down towards the figure, and he's saying to, really saying to John, I want you to bear her, I want you to carry her. And so I'm, I'm looking at this and I'm creating from that, from what I understand within this word in the crucifixion, but my dilemma is how does it connect somehow to the Holocaust? The Holocaust survivor has something that looks like fabric around his neck. And on closer examination, it's, it's clearly a very emaciated body. And the legs, the buttocks are about over here, the legs are hanging down here, and the rest of the body, the head, over here. And I asked Rick, what, what is that? Before I even realized that it was a body. And he said that he'd never met a Holocaust survivor that wasn't carrying their dead around with them. 
And that to me, first of all, I'd never had, I'd never heard it put that way and it's exactly right. I've never met a survivor that wasn't carrying their dead around with them. And the survivors that have let down the burden, the second generation has certainly taken it up. I feel as if I'm carrying not only my family's dead, but six million, and for the 2,000 years before, around with me. But the fact that he would understand that and see that and portray that is to me unbelievable. And in a way, the, the identification back to the word from the crucifixion, what he's carrying on his back becomes a relationship that he's not naturally connected to. It's, it's not who he was before the war began, but it's something from this point on in his life that he has to carry with him always. He's always carrying the dead with him everywhere he goes. And it becomes a relationship that's unnatural for him, but now totally a part of what, who he is. The next word in the fountain to that is, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? It's the last thing that Jesus could imagine, the abandonment of the Father, when he had known the presence of the Father so, so interwoven into his life. The figure representing the Holocaust, the one of identification and reflection to the fountain is that it's the only figure that represents the Holocaust that has his back turned to the crucifixion. I wanted in this piece the sense that within the cry of abandonment, they're completely alone. They don't even have this dialogue now between the two of them. This whole fountain an expression of figures visually in a dialogue of suffering, like what I said in the beginning is crazy enough. But the idea of the person of Jesus within this word with his head shaved and his arm is numbered. For you to take it past just the fact that you're dealing with the crucifixion because each one of the other crucifixions, he's, he has a head of hair, and he has a beard. So it marks him. There's a little bit of a connection to how a Gentile would see him to be. But within this word in particular, the sense of the exactness of the faces, both of them are exaggerated. Both of them, it's like their last breath, all right? This one, because of the thrusting himself through time, it reflects, again, the sense of the Jews being pushed into the gas chamber, saying over and over again in a prayer, in a cry, written down within these diaries in a repetitive sense was Psalm 22. Again, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? When I discovered that, that totally flipped me. Because I thought all the other words, to a certain degree, are a little abstract. They're prophetic, there is an identification, but it's not verbatim what both of them saw, all right? When I got it from the Lord that when I tried to put hair during the sculpting part of the figure representing the Lord, and I felt like, no, there, there's to be no hair. And I started to realize just in a sense, how much is this going to cost me relationally with my Israeli friends? I thought, it's gone. It's everything God has miraculously given me as a Gentile. I will lose it within this piece of work. But especially in doing Jesus visually identified to them within the Holocaust. So I like, when I ended up getting the thing about Jesus having no hair and a number on his arm, I couldn't, I, I would try and tell Daphne about it. And for about two days, I couldn't get it out. I couldn't get it out of my mouth. I would completely choke. And I, it was, there was so much emotion and so many tears attached to this thing. I couldn't, I just couldn't say it, say it out loud. Because I didn't want to get my head around it. All of the elements within this word, a lot of times God gives you confirmation when you're not looking for confirmation. I didn't want confirmation. My parents both survived. My father used to call it the five-star treatment. 
Uh, they were both in Auschwitz. My father survived two years in Auschwitz, which is almost unheard of. It was only later I discovered, in listening to her lecture to a group at one point, how much significance the tattoo meant to her. My father almost didn't speak. I, I think he was engulfed with grief and with that, that he, you know, he never mourned, but he was uh, engulfed by grief and guilt at not having saved anyone. And uh, it came out as crying in the night. So I very quickly, I understood this and I somehow associated associated the crying in the night with a number on his arm and with a child's logic I thought that if I could erase the number on his arm then my father wouldn't wake up crying in the night and I would have a father who laughed and who talked like other people's parents um, so I sat him down one day with all of the cleaning materials in the house scouring powder, Brillo pads, anything you want, and I, I tried to get the number off. And he let me do it. Maybe he thought somewhere that my child's innocence could somehow erase everything that went with that, with that number on his arm. Of course, I didn't get the number out, and it, nothing was erased. The word next to that is the word I thirst. The sense on the crucifixion is that everything within him is being drained. The fingers are being pulled down. It's almost like everything within him is being poured out. The word after the word, I thirst, is the word, it is complete. For the Jewish people at the end of World War II, the identification to the word complete or finish was their complete destruction. The final word is the word, into your hands I commend my spirit. From the place of the crucifixion, all has been given. The place representing the Holocaust is again bearing this mantle of death. The, this mantle that so over covers him, pulls him down. It's at a place of collapse. And in a way, there's a reflection historically between 1945 and 1948, when in a way, those that survived were buried with the dead. They had no place to go. So when I looked at this, I thought, there's a death. There's a burial within these two personalities and within both of these places of suffering. Where's the resurrection? And for me, everything, none of it had been intentional to that point anyway. And I looked at it and I thought, a, a close friend of mine, a violinist, creates this fantastic piece of music called Oratorio Terezin. And within the relationship with her, the relationship with the music, the music was based on children's poetry from the Holocaust. It was specifically the place was Terezin, and a ghetto that the Nazis created just outside of Prague. But for us personally, for Daphne and I, some of our closest friends who are survivors were the children specifically from Terezin. So in a way, it connected us in a lot of ways. So when I heard the music, I had to do something in touching this. And I started to do sketches. And what you see within this, in relationship to the Fountain of Tears, that in the beginning, I didn't think there would be a relationship with this piece. This was something separate from this. But I began to see the child within within this crematorium, and in a way what you see is a child curled up, almost in a fetal position, but inside the crematorium, leaning against this closed door. When you turn the piece around, what you see is the arm of the child that you don't see from the inside is actually penetrating the door. 
The hand of the child is clutching a small piece of ground that symbolizes Israel, becomes then the butterfly that the child never ever sees. The book itself is called, I Never Saw Another Butterfly. This was the book that had motivated the music, but symbolically within this piece, the land and the butterfly, in a sense, become one because it's the, the thing that the child never, ever gets to see. He motivates, motivates to a certain degree the hand going into the ground, the flight of the butterfly, but it's something that he never sees and in a way he never feels, but he's totally a part of it. But actually the butterfly exhibit, that, that, that makes you cry. That, that, that piece was, I mean, hold on. <laughs> that piece is something that, for me, brought the whole dialogue on Christianity and the Holocaust home. I, I think the sculpture can be the opening of, of a dialogue. Um, I, th I think many Jews would probably be uh, upset and angered about this, you know, first of all, that, that balance and, and Jesus being in dialogue with a survivor and, and what's that saying and, and it's in his own name and, and how can that be? Um, but I, I think it's coming from a place of being able to talk and, and I think we, we need to discuss it. I think that um, you know, Jews need to be able to say, this, this is hard for me and this is problematic and I'm not sure I allow you to do this. I'm not sure I allow you to put this dialogue or bring the Holocaust survivor to a dialogue. And these are all things that I think will be difficult to discuss but that we need to discuss. And, and his sculpture, I, I think, is a platform. There's uh, tons of books out there about the Holocaust and unfortunately now many of these Holocaust books really don't see sales often in the bookstores. They're written as a historic record, which is important, but yet you don't have anything of a shock value. And I think Rick's work brings it back home that we can actually talk about the subject in a very different light as, yes, a historical record, but now where does Christianity play its role now at six decades after the event? Now the discussion begins. And so within the final piece, it's a, it's a representation of relationship. It's a resurrection birth based within relationship. And it's the two parts of the dialogue that have spoken, reacted within this dialogue, within the fountain and the response, this back and forth within these seven last words. And somehow them coming to this final point of them recognizing each other. Both, both the figures are represented half body coming out of the same stones that represent and touch the memorial to the six million of those that perished. These two are now coming out. They're both embracing. And in a way, it's, it's a recognition of who each other is. And in, in, in some way, recognizing each other's suffering, it becomes a fellowship of suffering. That both understand and both find themselves within this embrace underneath the cup. The cup now that's been drunk to the full, it becomes almost the place of a shadow that both find themselves underneath and finally coming into a place of recognizing each other within the space, amen.
וגם 